child of wrath I walked Condemned in darkness But your mercy brought new life And in your love and kindness Raised me up with Christ And made me righteous You are the light that broke the darkness And you satisfy my soul when I am heartless And if ever I forget my true identity Show me who I am and help me to believe that you have bought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love. I made a life forever with you, life forever by your grace. I'm saved. been erased Oh, and I'll never be the same My sin has been erased And I'll never be the same Cause you have bought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love I made a life Forever with you, life forever by your grace. I'm saved. You have brought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love. I made a life forever with you, life forever by your grace. I'm saved. Uh, new song Saturday at Terra Nova, which is always a highlight. Every time it rains, no, the two aren't related. Uh, but we are going to learn a new song tonight. I'm going to teach you the chorus. I'll sing it once, and maybe we can sing it together. Okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to I'm going to sing it no matter what. Okay, so. You're higher than the sun. But you're the only one who can make our gray skies blue. You're brighter than the stars. Everything we're wonderful by far, and we give our praise to you. We try that together. You're higher than the sun, but you're the only one who can make our gray skies blue. You're brighter than the stars, more wonderful by far, and we give our praise to you. All right, let's try. are hung like the jewels in the crown of your glory the universe expands it's exploding 
overflowing with your grace We've seen light years of love Travel through all time and space You're higher than the sun But you're the only one Who can make our gray skies blue You're brighter than the stars We're wonderful by far And we give our praise to you The planets were formed in the palm of your hand You're the center of everything All you see is yours to command And you're higher than the sun But you're the only one Who can make our gray skies blue You're brighter than the stars More wonderful by far And we give our praise to you you're higher than the sun, but you're the only one Who can make our gray skies blue You're brighter than the stars, more wonderful by far And we give our praise to you In the works of your hand, more than just for show But they tell us what they know That there's one greater Higher up above And the sun Never sets On your love You're higher than the sun You're the only one Who can make our gray skies blue You're brighter than the stars More wonderful by far And we give our praise to you You're higher than the sun But you're the only one Who can make our gray skies blue You're brighter than the stars More wonderful by far And we give our praise to you Says I'm perfect in his eyes So why do I ever doubt it? He won't ever change his mind Oh, 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 oh. Only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me That's all you've ever been that's all you're gonna be Only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me I am my father's dream I am my father's dream He only sees me with delight All oh, my innocence redeemed my reputation reconciled I'm the prize of his suffering He bought me with the blood of Christ Oh, 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 oh Only ever good You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me You're only ever good, only ever good You're only ever good to me That's all you've ever been 
That's all you're gonna be You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me That's all you've ever been That's all you're gonna be Only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me It's your nature, you can't help it What could stop all your goodness Since forever you've been like this What could stop all your goodness It's your nature, you can't help it What could stop all your goodness Since forever you've been like this What could stop all your goodness It's your nature, you can't help it What could stop all your goodness Since forever you've been like this What could stop all your goodness? You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me That's all you've ever been That's all you're gonna be That's all you've ever been That's all you're gonna be That's all you've ever been You're only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to me You're only ever good, only ever good You're only ever good to me That's all you've ever been That's all you're gonna be Only ever good, only ever good Only ever good to be Well, you're good to me Tonight we are, we are seeking just to find ourselves in the center of you, in the center of your peace, in the center of your spirit, God. The week has a way of just creating tremendous misalignment. So God, we are here tonight hoping to align ourselves with you more closely better, whatever the right word is, God, just to be in step with who you are and who you've called us to be. God, we thank you that your love for us doesn't change. God, if we could have gotten you to unlove us, we would have done so a long time ago. But your grace and your mercy, God, they just keep going past every every sin, every every struggle we've ever had, God. 
And tonight is a celebration of your grace and your goodness. sings together you give life you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord It's your breath in our lungs. So if we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So if we pour out our praise to you only. Great. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise your breath in our lungs so if we pour out our praise to you only and all the earth and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you Lord great
thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy extended to us, God. We thank you that in the midst of every storm, your love and your light shines bright for us, God. We thank you so much for that. Amen. Well, uh, we don't always get to say this on a weekend, but it is a rainy weekend around here. So it got me thinking, What's your kind of rainy weekend go to? Is it is it a book? Is it let's watch a movie? Let's go out. Let's mow the lawn. I don't know. Uh, for a lot for all of us, it was uh, let's gather together at Terra Nova tonight. So that's a good thing. So introduce yourself to somebody next to you and ask them what's your kind of rainy weekend go to activity. Go for it. Um, my name's Ashley. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, we're just glad you're here if you're a guest. I hope you have a great time. Hope you grab some popcorn. Uh, we're just glad you're here. Uh, and as we all came in, we got our weekend program. So you can just take that out. We have a lot coming up. We're officially in March. My brain says it's February, but it is indeed March. Um, so just get on track with that with me too. But we have some fun things coming up. If you maybe saw a table on the lobby, we have our women's retreat. Uh, we'd literally, really love for you to just check that out. I call it like the ladies retreat, the sladies, the ladies who slay come to the retreat. It's going to be a good time. Um, we also have a Terra Nova tours coming up. So if you're maybe wanting to know more about Terra Nova, our reliefs, who we are, um, definitely check that out. You can um, write tour me on your connect card. There's free lunch, free childcare. It's a no brainer. And we hope that you'll just uh, participate in that. If you'd like to be there again, just write Tour Me on your Connect card. Speaking of Connect card, um, if you don't know what that is, it's something that we have in the back of our program. It's also on the Terra Nova app. And this is something, uh, whether you've been here for a long time or even if you're a guest, we would really love for you especially to fill this out because it's an opportunity for us to just connect with people every weekend. Um, you can check off any boxes if you have any questions or like I said, like sometimes if we have things like a turnover of a tour, write that on there. Um, but you can also write down a prayer request and there's a lot going on with every season that comes. There's just always new things going on in our lives and we know that uh, everyone can use prayer and so please just write something down. Our prayer team and staff would just love to pray for you. Um, if you're a guest, fill this out as well. We would love to just connect with you and just thank you for coming. Um, and you can drop it in the offering on your way out or just submit it on the app and we'll make sure we get that for you. Um, but speaking of March, I, like I said, there's a lot coming up, but one of the biggest things, which Again, my brain says it should be in April, but it's Easter and it's in March. It's the very last weekend of March and it is sneaking up really quick, like four weeks away. It's hard for my brain to like wrap around that, but my mother-in-law like sent me the Easter menu she's serving already and I'm like, whoa, okay, so I have to like approve it. I'm like, yes, that, all, all that food sounds really good, but wow, you're like really on top of it. So people are thinking about Easter already and so are we because Easter as followers of Jesus is one of the biggest things that we celebrate um, as a community of followers, and we're already just planning for five amazing gatherings, all identical. Saturday is going to be extra fun because we're going to have our annual Easter egg hunt for the kids, of course, at 2, and then we'll have our gatherings at 3.30 and 5 p.m., and then Sunday, 9, 10, 30, and noon, which works great because if you want to have a morning breakfast or brunch, you can do that and come at noon or vice versa, so we really want to have so many options, especially because we know that this is a really great opportunity to invite people. This is an opportunity where people might say yes more often than they maybe say no. And so we acknowledge that and want to give you so many options to invite people to. I decided that my way of inviting people this year was going to be wearing my special Easter sweatshirt that says, somebody loves you. And that somebody is Jesus. I don't know how that's going to land when I invite people to Easter, but I feel like it's kind of cute. Like, I love a good pun. In my head, it sounded better. As I said it out loud, I don't know if that's going to land the plane, but luckily, we're going to have fun ways for you to invite people in the following weeks, so stay tuned. You don't have to have a corny pun crew neck to get people to come, um, but we're going to be rolling out fun ways for you to just invite friends and other friends with families, um, and even to serve, because we got to load up those serve teams too, so just stay tuned for that. There's a lot coming up, but definitely mark your calendar if you already 
have an Easter dinner menu you're planning and you gotta plan around that. Um, <laughs> but again, we're so glad you're here tonight. I hope you have such a wonderful um, evening with us tonight, especially because you're the coolest crowd um, of the weekend. But again, uh, we're excited. Mark your calendar for this. And we're gonna be jumping into part three of our series, Renovate. <laughs> It's uh, great to be with you uh, as we continue our series called Renovate. And it's, of course, uh, pretty impressive uh, when someone uh, is skilled and can do what we just saw, like, you know, with a piece of furniture. Uh, but what we're talking about uh, this series is something that's actually so much deeper and so much important. It's spiritual renovation, which is the way our old self becomes new. Now, now, I don't know if uh, you're handy with renovating things or not, but you, but you know how it works is that you can get an old chair like the one that you saw on OfferUp or Facebook Marketplace, uh, and then you can go ahead and uh, dial up you know, something on YouTube that might be helpful while you're driving uh, down to Home Depot uh, to get all the supplies, right, and all the tools necessary to do the job, and then you can just get after it, right? And you can give it your best shot, make your best attempt, but if things don't work out, is that you can just scrap the project, get a saw, turn it into firewood, and get a new one. But now here's the thing, is that you can't do that with the most important renovation project that's going, which is you. I mean, you see, all of us is that we have to make the life, the one life that we've been given, work. And we'd like that to be the case with the other people that we share this planet with, right? I mean, so let me ask you, do you have someone that is kind of in your orbit whose life really isn't working well at all, uh, where you wish that you could be bold enough and brave enough to sit them down and stare them straight in the eye and say, you really need to get your act, act together. Thank you. Okay, we're going to keep it PG tonight, right? You really need to get your act together. You really need to get your life together. You really need to insert, you know, another word together. You need to get it t together. And, and imagine living in a world where that actually happened, where those kids or that husband or that wife finally got their act together, where, where those politicians or those bosses or those employees finally got their act together, their life together, insert another word together where uh, those salespeople or those tech gurus or those captains of industry finally got their together, where, where, uh, where those celebrities or those rich people or those poor people finally got their act together, finally got their life together, finally got to use another word together. <laughs> I mean, it'd be wonderful. But, but it's not happened because there's something that really stands in the way of that. And we've discovered in our series so far out of the book of Romans, now we know what that something is. So, so there's this guy named Paul, maybe you've heard of him, sometimes he's known as the St. Paul or the Apostle Paul, uh, really famous for being a leader of the Jesus movement in the first century world. Didn't start out that way, though, started out as being a Christian hater, a Christian hunter, uh, but then uh, through a miraculous turn of events became a devoted follower of Jesus and then spent uh, and dedicated his life to sharing the good news of Jesus all throughout the Mediterranean world. This guy, Paul, is that he writes to a group of Jesus followers in, uh, in the city of Rome 
home. It's actually probably a network of what we would call house churches at that time. There were meetings, and he writes a letter that will circulate to them. Um, likely, he writes that letter while he's spending the winter in the city of Corinth right around 60 AD. And, uh, and what we have Paul writing is an honest confession that exposes the real problem as to why we can't seem to get our together. Oh, uh, so, so here's what he says in uh, Romans chapter 7. He says, he says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good. Yep, it's, I, I've got all the best intentions, but I cannot carry it out. And then again he says, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, now this is Paul, you guys. I mean, he's the first century super Christian, right? Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, this guy named Paul is that he's the guy that's, that's always saying the right things. He's always doing the right things. Is that he's uh, uh, completely sold out to the Jesus movement. Is that he's leading. He's making disciples. He's making all the wrong choices. He's generous. He's smart. I mean, this guy, he's like the super Christian. But, but do these words feel like they come from someone who has their act together or their life together or there's something else together no not really but but now he explains why why he's why he's about this so he says now if i do what i do not want to do it is no longer i who do it but it is sin living in me that does it okay so here it is scripture identifies that problem as sin and i know i know i know is that we tend to prefer other words like mistakes or issues or dysfunction or temptation but let's just use sin it's shorter right now, now in our series is that we have defined um sin this way and we define it as a noun actually it might surprise you if you thought it was a verb we we've, we've said that sin is everything that's messed up with me and everything that's messed up with the world now, now, and this is a definition that's perhaps a different than what you may have thought. You see, you may have thought that sin is the thing that, you know, God really doesn't want me to do that I really, really, really want to do. <laughs> and, and of course, it, when we think that, is that cast God in the, uh, as some sort of cosmic killjoy? But I, I think our definition is more in keeping with reality in light of what sin does. Because you know what sin does? Sin separates. Sin separates. Sin separates us from God, and sin also separates us from people. And, and so in the end is that sin doesn't help us get things together. It does the opposite. Sin pulls us apart. Now, it's weird because, you know, sin has been sold to us uh, as freedom, hasn't it? I mean, you know, is that, that you know, when, it's, when you're living a life where you're not doing what God wants you to do, it means that you get to do what you want to do. It means that you get to do what it is you want to do, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it with. That's what it means, and that sounds like freedom. And yet, and yet we've known, we've seen this, is that sin, a lifestyle of sin becomes this dead end where the unfree live. We're, we're bound and enslaved to addictions and desires and selfishness and anger. I mean, I mean wouldn't it be better... <laughs> To, to, uh, to leave all of that behind. Wouldn't it be better to be free? Now, now I'm saying this because you need to know that freedom is a huge deal to God. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, freedom, just that word besides the word love, is, is, is probably the key marking of the Jesus way, of the Jesus path, uh, probably the key marking of a Jesus follower. You see, you see when Jesus kicked off the whole thing, uh, back in Nazareth, his hometown, is that he, he uh, emerges there as this, uh, as this on-the-rise rabbi in the area. There's rumors of him, uh, of what it is that he's doing, he, the, way, the, the things that he's teaching, the way that he's healing people, is that he shows up at the synagogue in Nazareth. Uh, they ask him to speak. There's a, a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He turns to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, and, uh, and begins to read uh, these words. And as he begins to read them is that uh, he'll tell uh, people later on in just a few moments is that these words that were written hundreds of years before he arrived in that synagogue are now fulfilled on that day at that place by him. So here's what Jesus says. He says, here's what I'm all about. 
The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And so here it is. It says, Jesus is saying, this is my mission statement. It says, you want to know what I'm all about? Oh, man. Well, first of all, you need to know is that I'm the, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, the spirit of the Lord is behind me because he has anointed me. You see, Messiah, the word Messiah means anointed one. He says, here's what I'm all about. You got a broken heart? You've got a broken heart? I've got good news for you. Good, good news for you because I've been sent to help your broken heart. And then when it, comes, when, it comes, uh, when it comes to our captivity, when it comes to our darkness, Jesus says, I'm coming to bring freedom. Freedom is coming. Here I come. And, and the later on, there's a guy named John that records the story of Jesus' life in his gospel, his biography of Jesus' life. And in John chapter 8, is that he, uh, he records some of the words that Jesus said about it. Uh, Jesus said, then you will know the truth. Okay, and go ahead and finish the sentence with me. The truth will set you free. Okay, very common. We probably heard that. But then later on, Jesus also says this about himself. He says, For if the son, so if the Son of, sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so no wonder uh, Paul, you know, the guy that we've been talking about, you know, this guy that wrote the book of Romans, the guy that wrote half the, uh, the New Testament, says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not give yourself to be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And, and so, so do you see, this is the whole point Paul's saying. The whole point of, I mean, I mean look at it this way. If, if you were to ever to ask uh, what does it mean to be a Christian? If someone were to ask you that, I mean, I mean, like a real Christian, you know, like a real follower of Jesus, you know, like bona fide one, okay? A Christian indeed. If someone were to ask me that, if this is what I would say. I'd say, oh, that's easy. It means that I'm free. I'm, I'm, I'm free. I'm, I'm free from the regrets and the shame and the frustration and the defeat with, with whatever... Our sin deal is, be it gossip or lust or greed or pride or anger or, or a mouth that shoots off or our need to control others or our addiction to porn or our addiction to drugs or our addiction to alcohol or our addiction to food or our addiction to applause, you name it. Free from it. Free from it. I mean, that, that, <laughs> that'd be pretty good, right? I mean, I mean, don't you want that? Don't you want to be on that journey where we live without sin as our master, master over our mouths or, or over our eyes or over our minds or over our insecurities or over our appetites for, for stuff? But, well, here's what I got for us today. Here's what I got for us. Four words that are going to help us in, in uh, that pursuit as we get time in Romans, the sixth chapter, Romans chapter six. And so if you brought a copy of the scriptures, you'll wanna go ahead and land in Romans chapter six. You'll go ahead and uh, use that outline that we provided uh, in your program to follow along. Some of you are already doing that. And let's go ahead and take a look at Romans chapter six, starting with verse nine. And Paul writes this. Paul writes, he says, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die again. All right, so the idea here is that once you die and you're raised from the dead is that you don't get to do it again, okay? So, you know, it's just, just there's a stopping point that's there. And then, and then he says this, he says, death no longer has mastery over Jesus. Death no longer has mastery over him. Jesus conquered the power of sin. Sin could not hold him in the grave. And then the next verse is verse 10. Is, uh, Paul says, the death that Jesus died, which is, of course, was a death on a cross. Um, he died once for all, for sins once for all, uh, and, but, uh, and notice that, that, that word all right there, okay? You know, he catches that once for all, for everyone. But the life he lives, he, he lives to God. So, so what, what Paul is saying is this. is says when Christ died, the power of sin, which is always connected to death, is broken. And, and when he came back to life, it shows that sin has no power over Jesus like it ever did. Now, this is pretty deep theological stuff, but, but, but he finally turns the corner now to what it is that we do with all of this, practically speaking. And we talked about uh, that in the last couple of weeks uh, during our series about you know, uh, this uh, passage of Scripture that we're going through that we believe is one of the most theologically dense chapters in all of the Bible. But this is where we get to the place 
where we deal with the practical stuff. And so I know that you've been ready for this. Uh, you've been ready to, to dive in, ready to go going with this. And so he gets into this now in the next verse, verse 11. In verse 11, he says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay, so, so this is where I told you four words. We're going to get into four words. Here's the first word. The first thing that we do uh, based on verse 11 is we deduce. We deduce. Okay, so that's our first word. And, and we get this word from the word count, uh, from the word count, which is from the Greek word legitsomai, which back then was an accounting term, which means to consider or accept or believe or, or to factor in, all right? So, so now it was commonly used metaphorically uh, uh, this way in the sense of fully affirming a truth of having unreserved confidence in the reality of what the mind acknowledges. Okay, so we're figuring it out, like we're adding it up. That's what this word uh, means. And, uh, and so here's what's going on here. Is, uh, is, is here's how this works, is that you and I have a mind. You and I have a brain, right? And so this is what the brain does. The brain deduces, it makes deductions. This is where we think things through. So when sin comes knocking on our door is that we, we think it through and we come up with this conclusion is that we're, we're dead to it. We're unresponsive. And so this verb, legitimai, is also in a specific grammatical tense uh, in the uh, Greek New Testament that renders it to mean that it's an ongoing habitual command, all right? It's not like this, this thing that happens, you know, like a one-off suggestion, you know, a thing that happens just like one point in time and then it's done. But really it speaks of something that we need to weave into our lives daily, again and again and again, we're to stop and deduce, to think through that this sin that's kind of out there, okay, there it is, and it looks real good, mm, man, I want to do it, and I've done it before, is that we think that this sin will not bring life, because Jesus is the one that brings life, okay, okay, so we deduce, we start off that way, and here's the next thing that you do, the next thing we do, number two, <clears throat> number two is that we determine, let's look at <clears throat> the next verse, verse 12, it says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Now, Paul's going to get real crack practical here. Take a look at that word, let. It, it tips us off uh, that we can let things happen in our lives one way or the other. I mean, that's how life works, right? I, I mean, see, when we wrestle with sin is that we get to determine, though, which side of the argument that we get to be on, okay? Then you're saying, well, what do you mean by that? Well, let me just... Uh, uh, roll out for us there's 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 two arguments okay and that uh, it's like uh, each side of a coin um and um, it it uh it's there in the book of romans uh we uh, start off with the first argument which is what we would call the in adam argument if you were here in week one uh and that we spent uh, some time just introducing ourselves uh to the section of scripture that we've been dealing with is that uh, we find paul uh, talking about christ of course okay duh you know he's a christian but he also talks about adam and he talks about adam as this one man uh this one man that um, that sin entered the world through and he talked about how it is that we are connected to adam as his ancestors and that we uh, also um, have been sinners in our nature because of Adam's sin, okay? So this is the in Adam argument, um, and, uh, and the in Adam argument really can boil it all down to is this idea of life lived on our own. You know, it's like we're just, we're kind of doing our thing. Uh, God's kind of outside the picture. Actually, we're the ones that are calling the shots, and this is what the in Adam argument looks like. Uh, well, nobody's perfect. I've always been susceptible to this. I can't help it. This is natural. This is normal. This is what guys do. This is what women do. This is what college freshmen do. Give me a break. Nobody's perfect, okay? So this sounds a lot like the series uh, that we uh, did at the very beginning of the year on excuses. Remember that one? Okay, you guys are like, oh yeah, I can see that coming. And you can see it coming all the way back uh, to the very beginning in the book of Genesis, back to Adam, back to the temptation, back to the original sin, back to the, oh, you know what? That woman that you gave me made me do it, you know? that excuse and then back to the excuse of you know what the serpent told me about it and I ate it okay some of you guys are tracking with that because you know some things about Genesis that's the in Adam argument okay so but there's another uh, there's another argument and it's the in Christ argument the in Christ argument works this way that thing that's out there that sin that's out there you know the one that you did the one that you kind of like to do well as you see it just we understand that sin it's trying to rule me, and sin brings death, 
and I've had enough death in my life. It has nothing good in store for me. Why in the world would someone who's free from sin want to be a slave to that stuff? Okay, so do you see how, how, how this works? You see how this works? Now we're ready, aren't we? Okay, when you get in the car and the traffic is bad and the people that are around you are, uh, are very high maintenance and very tense and very cranky and the chores didn't get done, you know, your to-do list is out the window or that person emails or calls or whatever that creates that temptation is that we're going to determine this, right? We're going to believe God that sin is not my master. We're going to believe him and we're going to determine. We're going to let. That's what we're going to do. And then, and then we're going to do a third thing. A third thing connected to it is that we're going to declare. We're going to declare. We're, we're going to make a declaration. You know, sometimes it just helps to call things for what they are and, and even to do it out loud. Now, now, actually, we did this last week. Is it some of you were here last week? It was great. And that uh, John led us through this, uh, this, this, uh, this statement that we spoke together out loud and encouraged us other way. The statement was, I am dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay, this week, we're gonna go more short and simple, all right? We're, we're, what we wanna do is we wanna try this one. Okay, we're gonna say this together out loud. You ready? Okay, so here we go. Sin is not my master. All right, let's go ahead and say it a second time. Sin is not my master. One last time. Sin is not my master. All right, that's great, isn't it? I mean, because, hey, we got some good news here, guys, is that sin is no longer your master. You're not in its grip anymore. It doesn't hold anything for you. And finally, and finally, here's the fourth thing we need to do, is that we need to devote, to devote. Take a look at verse 13. Devote. It says, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. So we're to devote, and you're saying devote what? And so you see what we devote. <laughs> we devote our parts. <laughs> every part of ourselves we get to devote. We get to offer up to God every part of ourselves. And, and then I find that this devoting in a practical way happens when I pray. Or, or it's a form of prayer uh, for me. Now, now, now some of you have, uh, have caught word that I am a surfer. And, uh, and I know, uh, because I don't look like one, right? Um, so it throws you a little off. But, uh, but yeah, uh, for decades and decades is that I've been down and, uh, and surfing and riding waves. And, uh, and I, I love it, but it's like one of the most difficult things that you'll ever do. Uh, surfing is really hard to learn. So, so if you're thinking about surfing, not recommended. Okay, so if you want to, you know, learn something easy, a sport easy, go play pickleball, all right? Because pickleball, we can teach you, some of you can teach us how to play pickleball, it, you know, give you a half an hour and we'll get you up and playing easy, pickleball good, surfing bad, okay? So that's how that works. I know what you're thinking with there, but, uh, but you know, I just keep doing it. Um, even though uh, uh, some of my surfing skills have degraded somewhat, I, I still keep doing it because I just love the, the feeling of, of, uh, of gliding along on a wave that God has created. And I also love the feeling of being with uh, my surfing friends. So it's like a social thing for me. Uh, I rarely surf alone. I'm usually you know, trying to grab some friends to go surfing. Some of you uh, are here tonight, actually, that I grab and then we go surfing together. And, and we have this thing, you know, it's, it's kind of a ritual, you know, where we get together and we meet down at the beach and we tug on our wetsuits and we wax up our surfboards and uh, some of us stretch because we need to stretch. Boy, we really need to stretch. And, uh, and then before anybody hits the water, uh, there, there'll be one of us in the crowd that says, hey, you know what, let's go ahead and pray. And here's what we do is that we pray and we devote the surf session to God. We just give it to God. That, that, that's what, what we do. And, and, and now we don't want to limit uh, these types of prayers uh, to surfing or to any other hobby or pursuit that you have when you're going to have them. Because you see, we can start out our day, we can start out any day by devoting every part of ourselves to God on that day. L let, me, let me show uh, you what it might look like. You, we can begin by praying this, uh, uh, God, today, I devote my eyes to see as you see, to see who you see, to notice what you want. We say, God, you know what? I want to give you my eyes. I know that sometimes my eyes go in places that I know you don't want them to go, but for today, for today, I am going to give you my eyes, every part I devote them to you. 
And, and then we continue on, and we can, you know what, uh, uh, on a day, any day, is that we can say, God, uh, today I devote my mouth to speak words of encouragement and truth and praise. And God, I know, I know, I know, is that sometimes I have used my mouth to wreck such havoc, to create such damage. There are times that I look uh, back on with huge regret about the things that I have said where I have just blown it. But you know what? But today, today is not that day. Today, I devote my mouth to you. Uh, And then we continue on is that we can even do this, is that we can say, God, today I devote my face to reflect love and hope and acceptance and attachment. And, and, and I think that you know this, is that much research has shown that our facial expressions can convey a blessing to people. And it's no wonder that God's priestly blessing from the Old Testament, some of you might know that, is that the, the priests used to bless the people um, at the end of their time together by saying, the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord cause his face to shine down upon you. Now, I've heard that, and I was like, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, you know, what does it look like for God's face to radiate down upon us with his joy and his delight and his acceptance? It's just in the same way that, uh, that uh, a, a, a new parent with their newborn baby would just radiate that delight and joy to that baby. God does it to us. And you know what? We can use our face today to do that for other people, for God's glory. So, so today we can devote our face, but not only that, but we can also devote our mind to think thoughts that are true and lovely and right and pure and admirable and praiseworthy as Philippians chapter four, verse eight instructs us to do. And I don't know about you, but you know something? My mind can go all over the map, man. I just think about so much stuff throughout the course of the day. And think about the complexities of, the, this, of, of this current uh, moment that we live in where there's all different kinds of things that are just darting in and out of your mind. You know, I mean, it starts at the very, be- uh, at, at, at the very beginning of the day where uh, I bet that you do what I do is that you wake up and the first thing you do is do what? You look at your phone, right? And then all of a sudden there's there, there's all that day, there's all these things. And you know what? Uh, there is this big challenge that we have, Right? Uh, but, uh, but, but today, what we get to do is that we just get to say, God, as best as I know how, I just want to devote my mind. I want to devote my mind to think these good thoughts uh, for you. And not only that, but we can also devote our arms to God. We can devote those parts to include others to embrace them. And this is really good news if you're a hugger, right? Because you're just waiting, right? You know, and I know that for some of you, it's like, uh, I'm not a hugger. Don't touch me. You know, I I, I know that that might be your thing. So you might devote one arm to do the side hug. You know what I mean? That might be, you know, that's a start, right? I mean, it's just, again, you know, using your arms to be able to communicate these things, to include people, to embrace people, say, God, I'm just going to give you my arms today. So I do have somebody needs a hug. I, I'm not a hugger, but I'll just give them a hug. I will try, you know. <laughs> and how about this one? Is it that God, I give, m- devote my backbone. I think we know what you mean by backbone. It's just our way of saying, God, God, I, I do not want to be such a chicken today. I, I want to devote some backbone to live and to lead with courage and confidence. And so I'm, I don't know, I'm just going to give you that. And I'm going to ask that you would help me with that. And, and so, so, so you know what we're doing when we're doing this? You know what we're doing? We're getting our act together. We're getting our, our life together. We're getting our what, fill in the blank together. That's what's going, that's what's going on here. And, 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 uh, and so, and you know, if, if you're here today and that you're not a, like a God, Bible, Jesus person, you know, that you, maybe someone invited you here and you're still trying to kind of figure out all this stuff, is, is that maybe um, you're here today uh, hoping that, that, that there's something like this that there's something here, that there's some way to move you in life from the place that you are to the place that, frankly, that you really love to be. And that you might be hoping that there's some people that are devoted to this kind of same idea, that they're kind of in the hunt, that they're putting energy into it as they believe that they've been given one life and that they want to use it the best way that they can. And that somehow, maybe you've been curious and that you've come to, today to Terra Nova because these are some things that, have been, that you've been thinking about and, and that you were hoping, hoping maybe that there'd be something out here like this. And, and, but w- w- whether you feel that way or not, I just wanted to say, I'm just so glad that you're here. Uh, and so that we can just be together and we can explore just kind of what God's all about uh, together. So, so, so we devote. We devote all the parts of our life back to God 
for him to do good things with it. And we do that because we're dead to sin and alive to God. Now, now, now the way scripture defines it, as we saw last week, is, is this uh, old self and new self paradigm. And we, we talked about this. We talked about, you know, this old self, that's me 1.0. And really, it's my false self. It's, it's this broken self. It's the self that has been marred by sin. And, and, uh, and it would be really bad news if we just keep it, you know, on the low. But uh, what we have here is the possibility uh, through what God has done of really entering into a new self, me 2.0, which is my true self, my true identity um, as a beloved uh, child of God. And, uh, and you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's no, no question about what we're gunning for, about what our desire is, but, 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 but how do we get there? Well, well here's a way that, um, that we provided, again, another practical way to help make this whole thing real for us. Um, out in the lobby as you leave tonight, you're going to see that there's going to be a wall. And the wall is going to have a bunch of pictures on it. It's going to say before, and it's going to say after. And then there's going to be some cards um, that are there on a little pub table and some pens. And, that, and the way I'd encourage you to do is to make this whole uh, idea of moving from a 1.0 life to the 2.0 life, from the, to, from the life that is broken by sin to the life that is made whole through Christ. Uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take two cards, and one of the cards is going to say to strip away the old. And w- what you can do is to, t- to write on that card is that what are you trusting to get free from? You know, what's that thing? That you're like, ugh, I need this to be stripped away. Uh, this, is, this thing is like, you know, hanging on to me like barnacles on the bottom of my boat. And I just need it to be stripped away. And, and so go ahead, name it, identify it, write it down uh, on the card. And then you get an opportunity to take like a, a little uh, clothespin and just clip it to the line right there. You'll see a bunch of people have already done this. And so you can go ahead and include that as yours as part of what we're doing as a community. And, and, then, uh, and then, but don't stop there, okay? Don't stop on the left side. You need to go to the right-hand side. The right side is where what you'll want to do is to take the Create Something New card. And again, this is where you get to write. And you get to write, you get to write what new good thing that you're hoping you'll become. What new good thing that you're hoping you'll become. What is that? What, what do you think that could look like? And, and, uh, and so uh, what I'd love to, to uh, just invite you to do before you leave today is to spend a little bit of time on that because I think that this exercise gets us one step closer to God's number one priority. And we talked about it, right? God's number one priority. Guys, it's freedom, freedom, freedom. That, that's what you and I experience when we deduce, when we determine, when we decide, when we devote freedom. Now, you might be wondering, why haven't I heard this before? <laughs> and isn't God less concerned about freedom and more concerned about me following his commands and all the other rules and laws in the Bible? Well, um, if you're, thinking that is that you're not going to want to miss next week because we're going to pick up uh, in the next verse in Romans 6 where Paul says one of the most profound things in the New Testament and understanding this I think will help pull together the entire New Testament for you and so so just to give you a teaser for where we're going next week verse 14 it says for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace and so next week We're going to talk about this oh-so-important relationship between law and grace. But for now, I want to pray with you. So would you bow with me? Lord, we, uh, we thank you, God, that your face shines down upon us. God, that you're with us and that you're for us. And Lord, we want to take these moments, God, as we uh, just reflect on what it is we've heard from your word uh, to come to you and, and just to, uh, to bring before you those times, God, where, um, where we feel like that we've been doing this all alone and we've been failing. Uh, Lord, we're like Paul. God, the good that we want to do, we can't seem to do. And it's caused such angst for us. It's caused such frustration for us. It's made us feel so defeated. So Lord, we want to use this time to come to you, God, and to ask that you would give us help. 
Lord, that you would give us, Lord, what we need, God, the, 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 that you'd give us the, the heart that we need, God, a heart that is not brittle and tough, but a heart that's soft and giving, Lord, that you would give us, God, the mind that we need to really think clearly about your reality, God, that you would just give us, God, uh, the strength that we need, Lord, when we just feel like that, uh, that it would just be easier for us just to go with the flow. Um, Lord, we have tried to grind it out. Lord, we've tried to be good. Uh, but God, we're looking to you, Lord, for a different way uh, for us, Lord, your way that would transform us, God. And, and so for today, God, we just pray that you would just give us the grace for that. Uh, Lord, we need you. We seek you. Lord, we love you. And God, that we're looking uh, for you, God, both for today and the days to come to move us forward into this place that you call freedom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, listen, it's just been so great uh, to be with you tonight. It is a joy to be with you. And uh, as uh, we uh, get ready to head on out, just wanted to remind you as uh, you move on out is that you can place uh, your uh, Connect cards and, and any, uh, any other things that you uh, want to give us uh, in the offering baskets so the guest service team will have that. I uh, want you to encourage you to check out uh, some of the tables that are there in the lobby as well as the before and after project that I told you about. You might want to uh, uh, dial that in and that'd be great. And then we're going to look forward to seeing y'all next weekend for part four of our series. It's going to be a great one. In the meantime... Have a beautiful week, and we'll see you next weekend.